Okay. Um, who's been in the in all the presentations all morning? Okay. Well, thanks for coming to our Greek lesson. <laughs> every every class had a Greek. Every group had a Greek name, including yours. This is Zephyr. Does everybody know what that means? It's the goddess of westerly wind, winds. God. <laughs> No, that's not yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, as you can see, they designed a portable um, wind turbine, and they're going to talk about it. And this one is Presenting today, we have myself, Reese Ticketon. I am the design team lead of the project and the electrical design lead. Joining me, we have Adriana Jackson, the structural design lead, Brianna Larkin, the mechanical design lead, Tia Coppola, the blade design lead, and Greer Grabowski, the data collection lead. We will be presenting today on, first off, we will recap the project. Uh, this will include any requirements that we must meet for the project and all of the necessary background. Then each system lead will go into the detailed design of each, each system, essentially. Uh, this includes, includes the electrical design, the structural design, the mechanical design, and the blade design. We'll then go into testing and our data analysis for all, the the, all of the results that we've recorded. Finally, we'll give us any administrative details and conclusions and recommendations. Shown on this slide are the final renderings of Project Zephyr's 3D printing wind turbine. There are two separate configurations. The horizontal configuration is shown on the left, and the vertical configuration is shown on the right. More detail about these configurations will be given later in the presentation. For the better part of a century, the world has been dependent on non-renewable energy resources such as coal and petroleum. Uh, slowly, there has been a shift to a more sustainable future of energy, as alternative energy sources have been gaining traction and uh, desire. Uh, while these, while this alternative energy shift is occurring, there has been a, a production of large-scale alternative energy resources. These include wind farms, which harness the kinetic, kinetic energy of the wind, uh, hydroelectric plants, which harness the kinetic energy of water, and solar farms, which harness the nuclear energy of the sun. Uh, while these are viable for large-scale generation of electricity, uh, the options for small-scale, personal, sustainable energy sources are limited. To add to the accessibility of small-scale, sustainable energy sources, Project Zephyr has designed a personal wind turbine. The, uh, as you can see, the picture shown on the right side of the screen is this same model right here. Uh, this is the final 3D printed version of Project Zephyr's horizontal axis. <coughs> uh, this turbine has a sim is designed to have a similar power output to those of personal solar panels, such as the one shown at the bottom of the screen. These personal solar panels have enough power output to charge and power small electronics, such as smartphones. Although the sun is not always a viable option on cloudy and windy days, on those, exa on those exact days, Project Zephyr's wind turbine will be a viable alternative. While there are options for small-scale and personal wind turbines available for purchase, Project Zephyr's design is intended to be open source. This means that the final design will be uh, published along with all 3D part files, drawings, and assembly instructions on a public outlet, such as websites like Thingiverse.com and GrabCap.com. This way, anyone who is interested in the project can download the files, purchase any necessary electrical and mechanical hardware, and replicate the turbine themselves for a relatively low cost. There are six vital objectives that Project Zephyr's turbine must meet if, to be successful. The first is to convert wind into measurable electricity. This includes generating 10 watts an hour and seven to eight meters per second wind speed. The second, all 3D printed parts will be printed within 14 by 10 by 14 inches. 3D printing is being utilized due to its accessibility, simplicity, and inexpensiveness compared to other manufacturing. Third, the pitch angle of the blades, when applicable, must be able to be manually adjusted. This is to ensure optimal efficiency in varying wind speeds. 
Fourth, the entire system must be under 15 pounds. This is to ensure one operator can operate and transport the, the turbine with ease. Fifth, the turbine must operate on two separate axes of rotation. This includes the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. And finally, there must be a system to slow and stop the turbine if, if necessary in higher wind speeds to ensure safe operation. On this slide is an example of a vertical axis wind turbine, or a VOD, on the left side of the screen, right next to a photo of Project Zephyr's final 3D printed VOD design. On the right side of the screen is a horizontal axis wind turbine example next to a photo of, once again, the same final 3D printed model of the horizontal axis wind turbine. I will now present on the electrical design of Project Zephyr's turbine. The electrical design is def defined as the system that converts the kinetic energy of the wind into measurable electricity. Along with this are two attendant requirements that must be met. The first is to once again generate 10 watts of power at the estimated rotational speeds of both blade designs. These estimated rotational speeds will be touched on in a few moments. The second requirement is to simplify the electrical design to ensure accessibility. Project Zephyr is assuming that all users or potential users of the turbine have little to no electrical design experience and wiring experience. Therefore, a simple circuit will make it easier to wire and use for anyone. Presented on this slide is the design overview of Project Zephyr's electrical system. It includes two major components. The first is a uh, two-phase stepper motor that is used as the generator for the system. Along with the stepper motor goes a design circuit as to essentially rectify the AC power coming out of the, the stepper motor into usable DC power. The generator selected, as I just mentioned, was a two-phase stepper motor. This is a NEMA 17 class two-phase stepper motor with a 0.59 newton meter holding torque. That means the turbine must, must create at least 0.59 newton meters of torque to make sure the motor is actually spinning. Uh, the motor is also rated to 2 amps maximum and has is purchased with a Harwin, Harwin female 4-pin connector. This Harwin connector makes the ease of connection into the circuit simpler for the user as they simply plug the connector into a uh, male connector on the circuit board. The circuit design for Project Zephyr is shown on this slide. It includes a mechanical load that goes into the stepper motor from the turbine. The stepper motor then generates two phases of AC power. These two AC outputs are then routed through two full wave bridge rectifiers, which convert the AC power into DC output. This DC output is then routed through two capacitors in series to further smooth the output, and then is routed through a purchase voltage regulator, which is represented as the R1 resistor on this circuit. The voltage regulator that Project, Project Zephyr has purchased is a buck converter voltage controller which has an output of 5 volts as long as the input voltage from the design circuit has, is from 6 to 30 volts. This is to ensure that over voltage does not occur and the, the device is being charged or powered such as smartphones. The input of the design circuit is connected to this voltage regulator through the screw terminals located at the top of the slide. And the voltage regulator includes two female USB ports for ease of access and use of charging and powering small excuse me, electronics. Along with designing a circuit, Project Zephyr included a printed circuit board design to increase, increase the accessibility of the turbine. With the, the printed circuit board is an exact copy of the previous uh, design circuit. It was included to ensure that the user does not have to do any wiring on a fretboard themselves. With the printed circuit board, the user can plug the Arwin 4-pin connector from the motor into the PCB and connect the PCB with the same screw terminal into the voltage regulator. And then the user can plug a device they would wish to charge into the USB output of the voltage regulator. To ensure that Project Zephyr's design will meet the power output requirement of 10 watts, a simulation was ran in National Instruments Multisim 13. This simulation did not include the voltage regulator as there was not one in the software itself. Uh, with this simulation, Project Zephyr found an output voltage of 15.7 volts and an output amperage of 2.1 amps. 
which equates to 33 watts out at a constant rotational speed of 1,000 RPM. This is the estimated rotational speed of the bot and hot turbine. Going back to the requirements, Project Zephyr has val theoretically validated that the electrical system can generate the 10 watts of power necessary to charge and power the small electronics. And the design has been simplified as much as possible to ensure that anyone can plug it in and use it themselves. I would now like to pass the presentation off to Adrian Jackson. Thank you, Ryan. To start off with, the structural design is defined as a single base that will house and support all other components of the wind turbine. There are two main requirements for the structural design. The first being that it must be able to be compatible with two different wind turbines, meaning that it must be able to support one hot and one raw blade. The second requirement is that the structural design must be able to house all of the electrical components inside. To meet these requirements, a four-piece base was these pieces include the top base, the middle insert, the bottom base lid, and the bottom base. These four pieces are detachable to be able to be oriented in two different orientations. The first orientation is the hot orientation, which is shown on the screen above. In this configuration, all four pieces are used. This will increase the overall height of the structure to allow for clearance of the hot blades. All four of these pieces are screwed together using coarse threads. The second orientation is the vault orientation, which only utilizes three pieces of the structure. To be clear, in this orientation, the middle insert piece is removed. This will shorten the overall height of the base. This increases the overall um, stability of the structure and lowers the overall center of mass. Again, these three pieces are screwed together using coarse threads. Going into more detail, this is the top base piece of the structure. This is where the motor is housed. The motor slot and rod hole are used to properly integrate and support the motor inside of the piece. This will be discussed further in the mechanical design section. Second, there's a bottom base assembly, which includes the bottom base lid and bottom base. This is where the electrical circuit is housed. The bottom base lid was designed to be removable to be able to place the electrical circuit inside of the structure after being printed. It acts as an adapter to go from the very large diameter of the bottom base to the small diameter of the middle insert. There is a USB hole that allows for the electrical circuit to be connected to the device being charged easily by just going through the hole. There are three stake holes that surround the bottom of the base to allow the structure to be staked into the ground during use. If soft ground is not available, the outer circle of the bottom base is thin enough so that it can be clamped to a flat surface like a table. Finally, there is the middle insert. The purpose of this piece is to increase the overall structure or increase the overall height of the structure while the hot blades are being used to allow for clearance of the blades. The wire slot is used to put, allow the wires to go inside of the structure while being used. There, the motor is housed above the middle insert and the electrical circuit is housed below the middle insert. This slot will allow for ease of transition going from the vault orientation to the hot orientation, allowing the wire to go inside of the structure without being disconnected. All four of these pieces were 3D printed using the F370 printer in the rapid prototype and lab here at Emory. They were all printed using polycarbonate ABS or PC ABS, which is a composite plastic. They were all printed using 100% ankle density because the structure must support all other components of the wind turbine. This is the finished um, orientations of the base structure in both the hot and bot. Um, the, in the bot picture, you can actually see the motor and circuit for, um, properly integrated within it. Going back to the requirements of the structural design, the first being that it must be compatible with both the bot and hot blades. This was validated because the turbine is able to support both the hot and bot blades during testing. Second, the structural design must be able to fit the electrical components inside. This was also validated because the bottom base is able to hold the electric circuit and the motor is able to properly, or the top base is able to properly support the motor. At this point, I would like to pass the presentation off to Brianna Larkin. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan.
Just to be clear, the mechanical design is a system that will allow Project Zephyr to have one single base structure that can have one motor that is able to operate on two separate axes. The one requirement for the mechanical design is to have a system that can interchange between the hot and bot turbine blade design. This means that the user will be able to connect the hot turbine blades to the turbine itself and generate power, then remove them and connect the bot turbine blades to the turbine and generate power. Project Zephyr decided that connecting both turbine shafts straight to the shaft of the motor was the best and most simple solution, since both turbine blades do in fact create a larger torque than the motor's holding torque. Shown behind me is the hot orientation, where the motor is rotated to face the side of the top base to, so that the shaft of the motor is along the horizontal axis to connect straight to the shaft of the hot blade. Similarly, in the bot orientation, the motor is turned to face upwards so that the shaft of the motor is along the vertical axis to connect straight to the shaft of the bot blade. For the mechanical design, Project Zephyr created a motor assembly. This motor assembly will be housed, was housed in the top base as shown on the right, and is, allows the user to rotate the motor about one axis around its center mass. Rotating the motor around its center mass was a very important aspect to the mechanical design since it allowed the turbine to stay stabilized and balanced when interchanging between the bot and hot orientation. The motor assembly consists of a motor housing, a support insert piece, and the motor itself. The motor housing connects to the motor using four screws at each corner of the motor, screw, screwing all the way through the motor housing and the motor. There are two holes on either side of the motor housing where two threaded rods are attached. These threaded rods then go through to the outside of the top base where the user is able to rotate these rods to turn the motor to face either the horizontal or vertical axis. Then there is a support insert that is screwed onto the top of this motor housing. A ball bearing gets press fitted into this support insert and attaches to both of the turbine shafts. This support insert allows the stress and weight from the both turbine blades to be distributed onto the motor assembly rather than all of that weight and stress being on the shaft of the motor. The motor housing consists of a top piece and a bottom piece. The top piece has a threaded hole in the center of it so that the support insert can thread into it and attach to the motor housing. The bottom piece has two side walls with holes on either side as previously discussed, as well as two hexagon holes on the inside. These hexagon holes are for hex nuts that were press fitted into, the, into them so that the threaded rods can screw in and attach to the motor assembly. Shown behind me is a more clear version of the support insert piece connection. The support insert piece gets press fitted onto the outside of the ball bearing, then the inside of the ball bearing gets press fitted onto either turbine shaft. On the left is the support insert piece connection to the, bot, or to the hot blades, and on the right is the support insert piece connection to the bot blades. The top piece and bottom piece of the motor housing, as well as the support insert piece, were all 3D printed in the rapid prototyping lab. All three pieces were printed using PC ABS plastic with a solid 100% infill density. This solid density was chosen to maximize the strength of all these three pieces since the motor assembly is housing the motor and needs to keep it stabilized in the system while the turbine is running, as well as be strong enough to support all of the weight and stress from both turbine blades without breaking. Show behind me is a finished, is the finished motor assembly. After purchasing all of the hardware parts and after all of these pieces were 3D printed, they fit together very nicely and no adjustments were needed. Finally, back to the one requirement for the mechanical design of having a system that can interchange between the two different axes. The mechanical design was validated and was successful since the motor assembly allowed the user to rotate and connect to both the bot and hot turbine blades. 
as well as support all of that weight without breaking while the turbine was running. I would now like to pass this off to Tia Coplow. Thanks, Bree. I'll be discussing the blade design. So the blades are what actually harness the kinetic energy of the wind and convert it to uh, electricity. So there are three main requirements. First, there needs to be two blade designs, one for the hot orientation and one for the bot orientation. Second, both blades must operate in the specified wind speeds. And third, the pitch of the blades must be able to be manually adjusted by the user. Here's an overview of our blade designs for each orientation. To design the blades, we started off with the fundamental wind turbine equation. This equation was simply used to determine if the size of our turbine was in the right ballpark. However, this equation does not account for electrical or mechanical losses and so does not accurately determine um, the power output of our turbine. To estimate the rotational speed, we use the tip speed ratio. The uh, table on the right is published data showing the correlation between coefficient of performance or efficiency and tip speed ratio for different types of turbines. So using this graph, we, we estimated the efficiency and determined the tip speed ratio. From there, we found the For the hot, we chose a traditional three-bladed wind turbine. Three blades was chosen based on other number of blades, simply because it has a slightly higher efficiency than others. Using the method I just described, we estimate, estimated the rotational speed to be around 1,100 rotations per minute at an efficiency of 25%. Each blade was designed using a NACA 63-215 airfoil. This airfoil was chosen based on its ability to produce lift at low wind speed. Each blade has a 10 degree twist addition. The nacelle shown on the bottom left of the screen contains three holes for which the blades are inserted. The holes are toleranced for the blades to be press fit. So the blades are inserted securely um, and can be rotated by the user and uh, won't fall out. There are additionally set screw holes on the back to secure the blades. However, after testing, we um, found that the press fit was sufficient to secure the blades. For the bot orientation, a hybrid design was chosen. The hybrid design consists of the Savonius blades on the center and then the Darius blades surrounding it. The Savonius blades operate at low wind speeds, however, they're very inefficient due to operating on drag forces. Darius blades are more efficient, however, they do not operate at low wind speeds. Together, theoretically, uh, the, we can increase efficiency while still operating at our wind speeds. Again, using the method I described, our rotational speed is about 955 rotations per minute at approximately a 25% efficiency. The Savonis design um, consists of two tiers. Each tier has cups facing in opposite directions. Uh, each tier is 90 degree offset from each other. However, due to restrictions from the RPL lab here at Emory Riddle, uh, we had to print it in three parts because it was much too large. Uh, you can see the three parts in the center photo. The slots were simply for assembly and all the parts were glued together. The top and the bottom of the Savonis design has little notches. These notches are for the Darius mount to be glued on. Additionally, there is a motor connection on the bottom one. The bot blades show on the left of the screen, again, a much too large to be printed in one piece so we're printed in two sections and will be glued together or shown on the left. A steel rod will, are, is placed um, throughout the span as shown on the top, right there, and uh, attached to the Darius mount through holes that are glued. The bottom Darius mount has a taper for the bearing as Brianna mentioned. All the 3D parts are printed at 50% info density to reduce the weight of the turbine. These are our final products, as you can, and you can see them right there too. So, to conclude, there are, is a design for the hot orientation and the bot orientation. The hot orientation did operate in the specified wind speeds. The bot, not so much. Um, as it started to rotate, as you'll see later in the presentation, it got way too unstable, so we had to stop it due to safety reasons. 
So we'll call that reform partially validated. Um, and additionally, for both turbines, the pitch of the blades can be adjusted using our adjustment parts. I'll now pass it off to Ms. Lebowski. Thank you, Tia. I'll be covering the testing and testing procedure for projects at first. Shown on the screen are pictures of each testing device that was used. The high-speed box fan was our, was our wind source, and the analog cup anemometer was used to measure the wind speed from the wind source. Stro uh, the stroboscope was used to measure the blade rotational speed of our wind turbine. An outlet power meter was used to measure the wattage coming from the wall out outlet to uh, the high-speed fan. The, an NI CDAC system was used um, as our connection from the analog anemometer to the computer. We used a uh, NI CDAC um, 9174 chassis and a 9201 module. And then finally we have the USB power meter which was plugged into the USB outlet between a um, phone and the electrical circuit to measure the wattage from the output. On the screen is a simplified diagram of what our testing setup looked like. Each instrumentation location is marked by a box and a number. On the screen is the physical picture of our testing setup. Um, the anemometer was placed off to the side of the wind turbine. Um, as we discovered, it was getting in, in the way of our airflow. Um, so we ended up moving back and forth. Um, the USB power meter was plugged in and set off to the side. The stroboscope was used off to the side of the wind source, and the outlet power meter was plugged into um, a, a beam above. This is the lab view interface that Project Zephyr worked with. The figure on the left is a speedometer that showed the wind speed from the anemometer. Um, as we were looking for seven to eight gauge per second, we were looking for that orange range. The white boxes are simply the inputs that are not being measured through the <coughs> device. So this is the USB power meter, the stroboscope, the outlet power meter, and the radius of the blades. Once we decided that we had our wind speed we were looking for, we saved the data, and from that, the torque, the radiance per second, the tip speed, and the tip speed ratio is calculated. So before testing, there was a number of pre-test safety checks that Project Zephyr needed to complete. Um, the turbine needed to be clamped to the table as we are not working outside. Uh, the wind source needed to be secure. The blade path needed to be clear. Um, a protection shield was put in place. And then the brake braking mechanism was present. For testing, Project Zephyr chose to use a simple braking mechanism of a piece of rubber attached to the end of a rod. Um, this was simply to, to increase friction um, as the blade, as the wind turbine was turning. However, this was not needed because we saw that once the wind source was turned off, the blade slowed um, to a stop by itself. Before testing, also projects that were needed to complete some equipment actions, such as connecting the anemometer to the DAC device into the lab view, making sure that all devices were in their correct location, turning on the instrument devices, uh, opening the lab view program, making sure all the sub VIs were there and that it was the data was saving to the proper location. Uh, this next slide is a video of the hot and testing. And then this is our bot and testing. So for Project Zephyr, we had a total of six days of testing. Day one, we just did the initial setup to prove that um, the way that the diagram was laid out was going to work. Uh, day two, day three, and day four were primarily troubleshooting with the lab view program, um, and then additionally with our anemometer. Day five was troubleshooting and data collection, and then day six was simply just data collection. Now for our troubleshooting, day one, we just worked with the initial setup to make sure that all of our devices were going to be doing what they were supposed to. Um, day two and three were debugging the lab view program. There was a few things that we were getting odd numbers. We were getting negative wind speed, things like that. Um, on day four, we discovered that our anemometer had shorted, and so we had to order a new one. Day five, we spent de power, uh, debugging the power measurement. We were receiving some very odd numbers from the USD power meter, 
So we decided to measure the voltage and the anemometer directly through the circuit, or the, the voltage and the amperage straight in the circuit. However, we um, discovered that when we were attempting to measure the amperage in series, the, so we are assuming is the internal resistance with the multimeter and the motor, uh, the motor was slowing uh, significantly and it was not, the turbine was not spinning as fast as it was when we were not measuring the amperage. And then finally on day six, we collected our final hot data and did some testing with the VOC. I will now talk about the data analysis and results. <coughs> So there were a few calculations that needed to be done. Uh, as our anemometer was analog, it had a voltage, so we had to calculate the voltage into the wind speed. We used the data sheet um, correlation um, for this equation. However, the data sheet was in Chinese, so we had to translate that first. Um, these, this is the testing results for the hot. Um, we had a wind speed of 7.57 meters per second, which is in our expected um, range. The tip speed was uh, 9.5, giving a tip speed ratio of 1.25. The blade rotational speed was found to be 420 revolutions per minute. We had a voltage of about 5 volts. That's what we were expecting as, uh, that's what the voltage regulator puts out. The amperage was showing as 0.07 giving a power output of 0.35. However, we're not completely confident in that amperage reading. And then the radius was 0.21. For the VOT, the wind speed was two meters per second, giving a tip speed of 0.16 and a tip speed ratio of 0.8. Um, the blade rotational speed was 114. Uh, in testing, it did not reach a fast enough speed for the USB power meter to recognize that there is being power being outputted, so we were not able to collect those measurements. This is a sample video of why we decided to end testing. Um, the video or the wind turbine start to, started to wobble significantly, um, and we decided for safety reasons to go ahead and stop. These are the final results that Project Zephyr has taken. So the horizontal axis wind turbine has a starting speed of about 2.4 meters per second and a maximum wind speed of about 8.5 meters per second. Um, this gives the power output of 0.35 watts and overall the hot weighed 8.5 pounds which is under that 15 pound maximum. Um, the vertical axis wind turbine had a starting speed of about 1.4 meters per second and a maximum wind speed of 3.2 meters per second. Um, we did not get a power output for this, and the weight was 10.6, also under that 15 pounds. I will now hand the presentation off to Rich Tipton. Thank you, Greer. I will now be going over the administrative details of Project Zephyr's progress so far. Project Zephyr was assigned a budget of $875 for the entirety of the project. This means that any purchase that was made for the purposes of the design and manufacture of the turbine was set to be underneath this $875. 3D printing was covered by the College of Engineering, so those costs do not take those costs were not taken into account. To date, Project Zephyr has spent $539 of their budget so far. Uh, this includes two buck converters for the voltage system or for the for the electrical system and two cup anemometers. There were two of these purchased because during testing, both of these shorted and fried, therefore we had to purchase new ones to continue. Along with these components, there is the USB power meter that was used for testing, one set of four camping stakes that was used for proof of concept for these stake holes in the turbine, uh, various amounts of hardware for the mechanical system, five team shirts, which we are wearing today, and one high speed fan. While Project Zephyr has a budget of $875, the, per the purpose of the turbine is to be as inexpensive as possible. Therefore, Project Zephyr broke down the cost of everything that goes into the turbine to determine the cost the user would have to pay to develop the turbine themselves. Uh, for the user to develop the hot configuration, that is a single base structure, the mechanical system, and the hot blade design, along with all the electronics inside of it, it would cost the user $138.23 <coughs> if they were to elect to buy the PCB that was designed, 
for $144.73 if they were to elect to build the circuit themselves. This is because the circuit includes purchasing a breadboard and jumper wires and the various components inside of it. Along with that is the bot build material. If the user elects to build or purchase the PCB themselves, it will cost $184.79. And if they, per they elect to build the circuit themselves, it will be $191.29. For both these configurations, the majority of the cost comes from 3D printing materials due to the high build size and the high infill density. For the course of, the pro for the course of Project Zephyr's work, from preliminary design to detailed design, Project Zephyr has put in 1,764 and one quarter hours. This is four and a quarter hours over the projected hours of 1,760. Excuse me. Project Zephyr has been above schedule and or right on right on schedule for the majority of this project and is very proud of that fact. Going back to the requirements of the project. There were six, of the, six major requirements that Project Zephyr must meet. The only one that was not met was generating 10 watts of electricity in the specified wind speeds. As Greer mentioned, there was a lot that went into this, so there are some, a few discrepancies in our data that we would like to uh, approach further if we would have more time. To conclude, Project Zephyr developed a working prototype of both con turbine configurations. That includes a hot style turbine and a bot style turbine. Along with this, the base structure that was created is structurally sound with minimal vibrations at high wind speeds. The user of the turbine can easily switch between the VOT and HOT system using the mechanical assembly inside, which just uses a three quarter inch wrench to rotate the system. The blade designs that were developed for Project Zephyr are efficient as they have a starting speed well below the operational speed of seven to eight meters per second. And most of all, Project Zephyr has developed a working prototype that developed a power output that can be used to charge and power small electronics, although the power output was low. For any future work to be completed in this project, we recommend, there are a few recommendations we would like to make. The first is to focus on one single turbine design. The hot and bot blades had different operational wages. They started, operated, and maxed out at different speeds. Therefore, if one turbine was focused, there could be a more accurate representation of the, the operational range and maybe more accurate data. Second, uh, we recommend op utilizing more accurate instrumentation during data collection. As Greer mentioned, there are some discrepancies in data with the, the uh, output, outlet power, no, excuse me, the USB power meter. And along with that, the anemometer that we were using has an accuracy of plus or minus one meter per second wind speed. Therefore, the wind speed we might have been operating in might not have been correct. Third, Project Zephyr uh, recommends allowing more time for testing. While we spent six days testing overall, most of that was spent debugging and troubleshooting our lab view code and the system itself. Therefore, more time for testing would be helpful and more time to figure out what is essentially with the data. At this point, I'd like to welcome my teammates back up. Thank you all for coming, and are there any questions?
And so in the beginning of your presentation, you had some commentary about solar, and uh, uh, I agree there are some limitations, but also the advantages and storage and just dissipation capability. So I mean, that's straight off, right? That uh, solar does have some advantages from that perspective. Uh, relative to your just overall results, um, I guess from a performance perspective, the vertical didn't uh, perform as well as the horizontal. Are you ready to give up on the vertical at this point, or what else might you be able to do to optimize it? Uh, team, would you like to answer that? Sure. Vertical axis wind turbines are not useful, um, especially at the <laughs> scale we're at, to get uh, a usable power output. Five or six times larger than that. Um, the horror, these turbines, there's a reason why people use these ones, why they're doing mass scale energy production with these turbines. Um, they're just more efficient. Okay, well, a good learning experience, but uh, maybe not uh, as a practical matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I wanted to also maybe um, also ask about uh, you made a comment, this is on the horizontal, that uh, you were measured. Suspicious. Yes. What exactly was the suspicion, and uh, what do you think you were really happening there? <coughs> you were, it was more than 0.35, wasn't it? Uh, we would like to think so. Uh, so when we actually plugged in, we I used my cell phone actually to charge it because I trusted my our design. <laughs> but so when we plugged in my cell phone to charge it, uh, it my phone lit up saying it was charging before there was any power output registering on the USB power outlet, outlet, outlet USB power meter. So therefore we kind of, we, that leads us to believe that there's some discrepancy in the accuracy or the, the, almost the pickup voltage of the USB power meter because it did in fact say my phone was charging yeah. when there was no power output coming out of it itself. Okay, right, 0.35 watts. We, we were really doing that, right? Yeah. Okay, so a little bit more. Was it the hardware or the instrumentation or some interaction between? It could be a combination of both. As Greer was mentioning, uh, we did try and get an, just a basic amperage measurement out of the circuit board itself, but as soon as we connected the amperage probe, you could actually hear the motor spin down. It, it almost sounded like a regenerative braking system. As soon as the amperage probe hooked up, you heard this whining noise in the motor and it reduced speed around 60%. As we were spinning at around 420, it went down to 150 RPM around there, and then we weren't getting any output at all. So it could be a combination of both hardware and instrumentation. <coughs> okay, yeah, it makes, sense. It makes sense, right? So um, let's see, uh, your structure was uh, 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 printed uh, uh, plastic material. You, uh, it also said in terms of the construction, you were using some other assembly hardware, like about a press in like an X nut. Um, I didn't quite follow, but in that, in the construction, uh, would there be anything that you'd be uh, thinking about or concerned about in terms of the assembly material? Uh, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't think of any reason to worry about that. It's mostly plastic and then just basic hardware. Uh, we have zinc plated black oxide nuts off of uh, McMaster car. So it's it's all stuff that you can purchase even at Home Depot if you would like. Uh, so they're, it's all kind of. Okay, okay from a durability perspective. And I am the kind of, kind of user, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this thing, right, when, when I'm using it. So yeah, just the durability of, of the construction is something of a key consumer product if you want to think about. Um, in your requirements, Perhaps it wasn't in the critical requirements, but uh, the environmental conditions that this, these have to operate in, is it like a uh, beautiful day in Prescott? Is it minus 40? Is it plus 120? Is it in the middle of the desert? Is it on the North Pole? Are there any limitations to the operations of the fan relative to the environment that it sees? Uh, we didn't actually look at any temperature limits on the equipment, but the electrical equipments do have uh, published temperature limits for all of the uh, components such as capacitors, the voltage rectifiers, and 
even the motor, they all have published temperature limits that you can operate in. So we could find that easily if we looked up, if we just went back to the manufacturer specification sheets. Okay. And then there's also the, uh, the temperature that ABS plastic will melt at, which is much higher than the operational range of the electrical stuff, I would hope. Maybe you don't need it. Instrumentation is 10 times more complex. The apparatus is much more complex. So I think as a practical matter, matter you learned a good lesson there in terms of, you know, there will be significant time needed uh, to do troubleshooting because sometimes you only have one chance for the test to actually work. And if you haven't put in the time, the diligence, the actual engineering that goes into it up front, make sure everything is right before you push the button, then uh, you, you just uh, you know, flush. Rapid prototyping lab ran out of black midprint, so they had to start. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it actually helped overall because using the stroboscope, it gave some contrast to the blades, so we could actually see them essentially. So it, it helped in the long run. We didn't think about it, but it was a, a happy little mistake. <laughs> For generating, it, I honestly, it might have to do with the maximum amperage that can come out of the motor itself, but that, that rating is actually for drivers, for motor drivers, if you're using this as a driven motor rather than as a generator. So that's the input amperage rating that's maximum. So it might have a correlation with the maximum out, but I don't know the exact correlation off the top of my head. So you don't actually know what the rating uh, from initial testing in the preliminary design semester, we were getting an amperage of greater than two amps out of it. So I, I don't know the correlation off the top of my head. I do know that we get more amps out of it than that. But. Coming back to your topic a little bit and seeing how we made the comment of the danger of the kids slowing down. I wonder if you can do it. I don't know if you can do it. I don't know if you can do it. Does that? That's a really good point, and that would definitely be something to look into. Uh, in general, throughout the electrical section, I like that circuit design that was on the next slide, but when you started talking about the voltage regulator and the PCB, I think in general, it's just a lot diagram. There is kind of uh, there is there is a concern for longevity of it because we did take this apart quite a few times to switch in between the turbines and to check the electrical equipment inside. 
Uh, and we could see small flecks or flakes of plastic inside of it just from probably the vibrations and it threading in, threading out. Uh, but we didn't have any issue with the uh, layer separation or anything or it coming loose. Uh, it was actually very sturdy during testing. We, the base itself had essentially no vibrations until it got up to the nacelle area. So uh, I don't think it would be an issue in the in the short run, but if it does become an issue, then thankfully with reprinting, you could reprint the base for not uh, not too much money, but it, it is an option. For example, I have some like very natural stress analysis on the plastic itself to show that your 70 80 meters per second is your anticipated weight dose structure and you know, those threads, even though we're carrying them in the moment, so that actually come on? Yes, last semester we actually did some ANSYS analysis of the weight of the turbines and the actual uh, torque put on the base if the base was clamped from the wind speed, and it, it did hold up in those uh, calculations. Yeah, so that was done with the weight of the, the hot turbine, and we got a maximum stress of 2.16 MPA, where the yield stress is 13 MPA. Obviously, uh, since it's ABS printed, there are layers, so that, that yield stress might be a little bit lower because of layer separation, but it had a, a fairly large factor of safety. We did consider that. Uh, the only problem was we had to be in close proximity to the computer to actually wire everything. Uh, so that, that, that is why we were that close to it. But that would have an effect. We actually noticed that just from standing next to the fan, we were getting an effect on it, slowing it down. So there definitely is some fluid mechanics problems going on in there. So uh, not that we could really calculate it with the instrument, instrumentation. off the top of my head. I just knew the general maximum dimensions that the rapid prototyping had, but I do know there are printers on the market that do have that same build size that you can print it. with the 
stress analysis you did, right? I think it's a lot of thought, but nothing much else. But did it really need to be that strong? And could it have been done with the only maker mod? Uh, so, in fact, our bot blade design over there is printed with PLA. Okay. Because uh, we, that was the one thing that the rapid prototyping lab did not want to pay for to print in PCABS <laughs> because it was very large. So we did, in fact, print that in PLA. And that might have had something to do with the, the vibrations during testing later on. But uh, we did, in fact, use PLA for some of it. And it could be an option. Uh, it would be up to the user if they would like to do that. Uh, but this is definitely over design. We could definitely do uh, lower infill densities. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, there was essentially no vibrations during testing. It was very structurally sound. This is one last thing, but the PCB that you did, you, you alluded to them where they bought the PCB. I'm not sure if I saw that. How much was that? Uh, the PCB, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. This was a calculation I did earlier in the semester, but I went on to a PCB manufacturing website and it was uh, based on the calculation of purchasing 20 at a time in bulk. And I believe it was around five, six dollars because there's only five components on the PCB itself. So it's it's cheaper than buying the breadboard and the jumper wires and the electrical components and stuff. Only buying twenty of them is cheap. Exactly. I thought it was money making opportunity. <laughs> selection of the blade shapes and you consider some that might generate more torque from the axis of that shaft? So uh, we you, we chose a NACA 63 to 215 airfoil as Tia mentioned earlier due to its ability to generate lift at uh, low RPMs or low wind speeds. Uh, it's an airfoil that most wind turbines actually use using the ones in large wind farms. So that was our selection thought process on that. The twist in the blade was based also off of uh, wind turbine twist overall throughout the entire length of the blades. So yeah, does, and I, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, uh, we, we did think there was some thought process that went into it. We didn't just choose an airfoil and say, that'll probably work. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.